In this video, I'm going to be talking about a game called Yume Nikki, as well as how it relates to Earthbound. Both games are kind of these weird, surrealist, top-down kind of games, one being an RPG and one being something more unique. Oftentimes, I see the two compared a lot, but do they really have all that much in common? That's what I'll be exploring today. Also, I will be spoiling the fuck out of both of these games, so buckle in, because things are about to get spooky. Oh shit! I think the most concise way I could describe Yume Nikki is a 2D walking simulator. As unappealing as that concept sounds, there's something about this game that's kept me coming back to it. Maybe it's the weird environments, or the music, or the way you can just get so lost in it. I guess I should go over what this game is before describing why I even like it. The main concept of Yume Nikki is that it all takes place in a dream. That's what the title means, Dream Diary. You play as a shut-in named Matotsuki, or Mato for short. Your only real goal in this game is to find 24 different transformations known as effects. There isn't all that much which distinguishes the effect NPCs from the rest of the creatures in this weird world. As you explore the different areas, you'll notice that everything loops. When you walk in one direction, you might not even come across a barrier at the edge of the map, you just come out the other side. But the areas are often so big and empty most of the time, that you don't know where you've even been. The music also loops constantly, and I don't mean like normal video game music looping, where the song is like a couple minutes long before the loop point, the music in this game is usually like a 5 second loop or less. All of these things truly make you feel like you're in a dream, or rather a nightmare. Real. The whole game kind of has this gotcha, foreboding nature good. about it. You never really feel like you're safe apart from a few select areas. While a lot of this game's creepiness can be chalked up to the player's imagination having free reign to run wild, there is some overt imagery that's flat out spooky. A victim of a traffic accident on a derelict forest road, disembodied heads floating in a void, a mutilated image of a young girl. Hell, and whatever the fuck Uboa is supposed to be. I think a lot of the allure of this game, for me at least, is finding all this creepy shit. Like everything else in this game, none of it has any explanation, and it doesn't really need to. I think part of the reason Yume Nikki even became so popular was the fact that it seems so shrouded in mystery. There's a whole fan community that sprung up around this game, and there are endless theories as to what things mean. For a Japanese freeware indie game released in 2004, with absolutely no marketing to speak of, I'd say this game's done pretty well. People often say that Earthbound has a cult following, but it's games like Yume Nikki that truly live up to that moniker. Like, you don't see Mato being in one of the most celebrated video game crossovers of all time, like Ness has. Sakurai, if you're watching, please, I'd love to be proven wrong on this one. Anyway, I just mentioned Earthbound, so now would be probably a good time to talk about it. I always see people describing Yume Nikki as Earthbound inspired. In terms of gameplay, they're not really that similar. One's a huge RPG that has a whole story, tons of dialogue, actual combat with interesting enemies, all that sort of stuff. Whereas Yume Nikki has... almost none of that. Sure, you can kill enemies, but most of them don't retaliate and it's obviously not turn-based. Kind of weird considering that this game was made in RPG Maker. And other than them both being top-down pixel art games, they don't really look all that similar either. There is one area in Yume Nikki that is clearly, CLEARLY inspired by the game that preceded Earthbound, which is Mother. Just look at the two. This area is even called the Famicom World, which is the console Mother was released on. I think the tone of Earthbound is what people are getting at when they compare the two games. For the most part, Earthbound is pretty bright and lighthearted, even comedic at times, but it has those unsettling moments here and there. You know the ones I'm talking about. Moo Training, the visit to Moonside, and the entire ending of the game. God, the ending. In my personal experience, I'd only heard about Earthbound from two sources, Super Smash Bros. and YouTube. Gygus, the game's final boss, has cemented himself as one of the weirdest things ever put into a Nintendo game. You hear about Gygus and his influence for the entire game, but you don't really see him until the very end. The lead-up to him is insane as well. You visit this place called the Cliff that Time Forgot, a small area with only a lone, weird, silver tentacle growing out of the ground, and the dissonant sound of trumpets echoing in the endless black void. You then need to travel deep into the past, because that's where Gygus is attacking from. 
Yeah, it makes no sense, but most things in this game don't. Anyway, with the technology available to you, organic life can't make the journey back without being destroyed. So the main four characters have to have their brains basically transferred into robotic bodies. The place you're traveling back to is the same cliff that time forgot, but thousands of years in the past. And what you arrive to is... something else. The first thing you hear is the music. Just listen to it. This is actually a sample of an otherwise non-creepy Beach Boys song, Deirdre. But this is not something you'd expect to hear out of a Super Nintendo game. Then you get to Gigas, and the weird shit just doesn't stop. Gigas is just this thing in the background, a vague shape that people have found no shortage of meanings in. You can't fucking design something like that on accident. You just can't. The story of Gigas' creation is almost as infamous as Gigas himself. The story goes that Shigesato Itoi, the game's creator, accidentally walked into the wrong movie theater as a child, and saw a scene that, in simple terms, traumatized him. You can read up on the full story yourself because I truthfully do not want to get into it here. Gigas' dialogue is meant to represent, or even echo, that fear that he once felt. It's meant to bring up those feelings of pain and regret. Now let me remind you that this shit is on the same console as Mario Kart and Kirby Golf. Yeah, the two go really well together. And I think now is the appropriate time to circle back to you, May Nikki. The vague, weird, dissonant, outright, disturbing nature of the last section of Earthbound is basically what the entirety of Yume Nikki feels like. The looping, surreal music, the outlandish and bleak environment, the intense feeling of foreboding, and of course, the absolute mindfuck of what Gigas is. Yume Nikki is like if you took the last hour of Earthbound, along with how it made players react, and turned it into an entire game. Number 2, Undertale, Gaster. I've gone pretty long without going into detail about these two, and one of them is arguably the most well-known thing about Yume Nikki. This is Yuboa. Now, the way you go about accessing Yuboa sounds like one of those you can unlock Luigi in Mario 64 sort of rumors you'd hear at school. You have to go into this specific igloo, solve a teleportation puzzle in this pink sea area, and when you get to this house you might think you're at Yuboa, but no. Yuboa only has a 1 in 64 chance of spawning every time you enter the house, and the chance only refreshes when you leave the house and come back. How the fuck anyone figured this out without dissecting the game is beyond me. After Uboa appears, you're just teleported to an area with no escape other than pinching yourself awake. The fact that your reward for going through such a specific and menial set of steps just for a soft lock makes it pretty weird, but what's even weirder is that people like me seek it out for... fun, I guess. No, it's not even fun, it's just kind of there. It's as unexplained as everything else in this game, but its elusive nature makes it a lot more appealing. I guess it's kind of like hunting for a shiny Pokemon. There it is! There it is! There it is! It's a waste of time, and it doesn't really have any value beyond bragging rights, but goddamn, you know how crazy people go for shiny hunting. Uh, speaking of which, I've hatched something like 700 eggs trying to get a shiny Galarian Slowpoke using the Masuda method, and my left Joy-Con is probably going to disintegrate before the expansion pass comes out. Please send help. Anyway, back to the actual topic of this video. Face is another thing that kind of reminds me of Gigas, and you find it through similarly cryptic methods like with Yuboa. When you spawn into the dream world, you have a 1 in 3 chance of being able to find this weird pattern on the wall in the number world. Then you need to stab it with a knife effect. After doing so, you'll be sent into this room with this thing rubbing a banister, known as qq kun Pretty much any NPC in this game will stop doing what it's doing when you use the traffic light effect on it. But what's interesting about qq kun is that he'll actually speed up when you use the knife effect around him. You can't even stab him, he just speeds up. Then at the top of the stairs you're met with a door that is the exact same door that leads out of Marutsuki's apartment. And once you open it, you're greeted by this. Now 
That thing you just saw is what fans call face. It's one of the few things that can wake Marutsuki up other than her pinching herself. It's just... For some reason, face just seems more malicious than any of the other weird or creepy things in this entire game. Like, you can clearly see the parallels between it and Gygus, and if that is enough to wake Marutsuki up compared to all the other shit she has to see in her dreams, I don't want to know what that thing means to her. So we've established that Yume Nikki is a pretty weird game. On the scale of Taylor Swift to Death Grips, I'd put both of these games around here. I guess Earthbound's brand of weirdness is a much more goofy or charming kind of weird. A kind of, haha, I didn't expect that, that's kind of funny, as opposed to, what the fuck does any of this mean kind of thing what you get with Yume Nikki. Now, if I went and talked about every single weird thing in Yume Nikki that could possibly be analyzed, this video would be like three hours long. The things I mentioned are just kind of the more iconic or weird bits about it that are representative of the type of stuff you'll encounter in this game. But here's the most important question. Is it fun? In the wise words of Reggie. If it's not fun, why bother? Plain and simple, I don't think Yume Nikki is all that great as a video game. It's not like there's a huge narrative, or really good level design, or the gameplay itself is super special. A lot of what you're doing is just walking around aimlessly and seeing what it has to offer. It's like an art museum inside a dream. The most fun thing about this game is trying to make sense of what everything is, and coming to your own conclusions about it. But is that really fun? Is that the mark of a good video game? Is it cheap or pretentious to have the main point of the game just be, it's up to interpretation? Hell if I know, dude. In true Yume Nikki fashion, I offer you to draw your own conclusions here. I hope this video was just able to serve as a bit of an introduction as to what this game is, and why I kind of like it. And hey, if you do want to try this game, it's still freeware. Being a 2004 RPG Maker game, you don't really need the best PC in the world to run it. It's even on Steam right now. So download it, give it a try, and find out yourself if this game is for you. It might surprise you. Oh yeah, and there's also the 2018 reboot? Remake? I haven't actually played this game, but from what I've seen of it, it's a little more action-oriented than the original. I don't know, it's gotten some mixed reception, but having any sort of official sequel to Yume Nikki come out as recent as 2018 is surreal in and of itself. Oh yeah, and I haven't even talked about the dozens of fan games that Yume Nikki has spawned, but this video had to end somewhere. Please ruthlessly bully me in both the comment section and real life. If this video gets 80,000 likes, I'll make <laughs> all known deaths on iCarly part 2. Goodbye.